Good morning. Welcome back to Ribbon Candy Hooking. I'm Deanna. Happy Thursday. Not one of our usual days, but we're having a catch-up day this week. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. Let's see who's here. Format keeps changing. Oh, I see some very cozy things here. Leaves and coffee cups. And a chili pepper. A chili pepper, Jennifer. Really? Chili pep. That is a chili pepper, right? And a pumpkin and a cup of coffee. You, we were just, I was just out in the doorway here talking to Stefan. We were talking about the Cracker Barrel. I don't know if you know this restaurant, if you have it near you. It's one of these chain places with lots of like um, por uh, rocking chairs out on the porch kind of thing and kind of a small country store. And uh, the kind of place that for breakfast they offer you 20 different sides to choose from. And we were getting into talking about grits and corned beef hash and things like this and getting really crazy. But Jennifer, you just made me want something that they don't have at Cracker Barrel. But have you ever tried, like bakeries sometimes, I notice this more out west where you're from, more in that area. Um, bakeries making shortbread cookies that taste super spicy of pepper. Not like cinnamon spice, but actually pepper spice with cinnamon. So good, so good. And also the hot chocolate they've been making with pepper in the last few years. There's very few things about this chic and modern culture that we live in right now, but incorporating peppers into everyday eating is one of my favorite things. Doesn't sit well at all, but it is worth it because it is so tasty. Ooh, spice. Okay, spiced pumpkin chai latte. Got it. Oh, this is so the time of year for that. You would never order that in the summer, would you? Even if they, even if they allowed it. That sounds amazing. Crystal, good to I'll take two, right, Crystal? Make two for me, too. Two for me, too, just to keep me going through the day here. Barbara, good to see you. You made it. You are in damp Minnesota. It has been that kind of crazy week, hasn't it? I hope it's drying off for you there because we it, the storm came blasting through and just went crazy, savaged us again. And, uh, and now it's nice and peaceful and lovely and quiet and dry. I hope that's coming your way, too. Anita, good to see you. Happy afternoon. Coffee time again. Linda, beautiful, sunny, colorful New Jersey, the Garden State. I was just working on a garden. I'm, it just kills me. I, I, I have to keep the designs I'm working on right now secret because they're for a book project and they're exclusive. And I am dying to show you. It's that Christmas Eve thing where I have a few drinks and I go, do you want to open your gifts now? Why don't you open them now? Because I can't wait anymore, but I have to wait. I did a great sort of garden-themed piece uh, this morning. It was one of these days of being inspired, you know, and I bet you have these days too, where sometimes you just feel like doing mechanical robot stuff and doing hooking or punching or making progress. And then other days, you just don't feel like doing that at all. You feel like actually sitting up, maybe like at, at even the table or something and uh, doing drawing and sketching and things like that. I think Tara's been doing some sketching and some days it just hits you so powerfully that you have to drop what you're doing and yield. Just give way to the inspiration of doing something else, right? That is it's so nice to have that calling so strong. There you are, Tara. Good morning. Oh, I like those little th witch character in the pumpkin. We are getting so close to Halloween at this point. If you celebrate Halloween, we celebrate in a huge way. I feel like it will never be the days again. Of course, my dad passed away a long time ago, but the days again of dri you know, driving the wagon through the neighborhood with dog on the leash and using pillow, you know, pillowcases for sacks for candy. And those were such nice days. He was just smoking the whole time we walked around and that's what got him in the end, which is a sad part of the memory. But what great days. And those were the days in the 70s and 80s where our neighbors would jump out of the car they were hiding in dressed horribly and actually grab you people just don't people don't do that stuff anymore do they and i suppose they shouldn't but um it's so it's so watered down anyway and even in a crazy halloween neighborhood like where we are i noticed there's much less stuff this year and i'm attributing this to like the supply and demand problem that that exists in so many areas of uh you know for for people running commercial enterprises like supply is a problem right now for many things and um, I'm just not noticing that much stuff at shops and I'm not noticing as much stuff on people's lawns and things like that. Kirsten made a great point the other day and I didn't know using those cobwebs because I always used to stretch those cobwebs across my tomato plant holders to make uh, cobwebs, but I didn't realize that birds were getting caught in the cobwebs and dying that way. And that's a terrible, um, you know, pointless way to die. So I don't have any cobwebs out this year, but I think 
except for the inside of the house, cobwebs are a bit over for me because that is too nerve-wracking and too risky. Beverly, good to see you. And you know, Halloween is falling on Sunday this year. And I don't know if you have kids in your lives, but my two are off also Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, I guess, uh, autumn break or whatever already, right? Um, so it's such a good day to have Halloween. It falls on it falls on a Sunday and then the next days are off. It just seems like the ideal kind of a setup. You have all weekend to get jazzed up about it and then boom, there it is. And then you relax for two days in a candy coma. It sounds fantastic, doesn't it? And I loved seeing all your black cat rugs yesterday. And keep them coming if you have them for um, National Black Cat Appreciation Day was yesterday. That's why you're seeing so many black cats out there. Beverly, you've got gray mist, a little bit of wind. The ocean is really roaring. Drama. Oh, Mother Nature doing a show, huh? Robin, good to see you. Rainy, Wisconsin. Oh, dear. Raindrops keep falling on your heads out there. Suze, hello from Blustery Cold, Kansas. Oh, I'm looking forward to sugar. Thank you for reminding me, Suze. I'm looking forward to Sugar Skull Pumpkin Time tonight, too, on Zoom. We have our Zoom class tonight. We're working on our pumpkins. By the way, I sent the pumpkin stuff out, and I think one person I didn't because I was ahead of myself and sent it too soon. But I included, if you're wondering what this is, it's like a wooden dowel. And the reason I included it, it's like an, you know, an antique thing. I have a ton of them, and I don't really use them. And I sh I've showed this particular sugar skull so many times. Um, that I thought since I have them I just put them in with the kits for tonight so if you're uh, doing the class with me tonight this thing is an optional you know you don't have to you don't have to put your you know do a three-dimensional pumpkin sugar skull and put them on a stick like this but it goes really nice into like a little vase or something a little pot or something like that on the stick or you can just save the stick for some other time when you have like a super inspiration about doing something three-dimensional because it works really well Joy, good to see you. Rainy in Bradenton, Florida, too. Oh, man. Carol, you are on. Good afternoon, my love. Good to see you. Barbara says, I love the Cracker Barrel. Wish you had one near you. Me, too. Ours is not close. It's even past my mother's house. But, you know, it's the, the lore of hitting that shop, too, when they do all their seasonal stuff in the shop and gets you in the mood a little bit ahead of time, which is always okay for me. Um, they have such nice things in the shop, too, but, oh, it's so good. The one thing that they are missing at the Cracker Barrel for me is, like, a booze license because if I'm going to sit down and eat that much food and I plan to be there for a while, I would love to have a glass of wine. I feel like that's a major, major uh, drawback, but the food is so good. Dave, good to see you. Typical fall day there. I love pumpkin face. I'm going to be so sad but when pumpkin face is over. But pumpkin face can go right through fall, right? Right until we get snowflake, snowflake face. Matthew, good to see you from sunny northern Ontario. Ooh, that's where the sun's hiding, huh? Chrissy, good to see you on Thursday. Linda, Suze, Chrissy. Catherine, good to see you. Southern California, beautiful sunshine. I bet. Oh, I bet. I haven't been to California in, in years, ever since the touring years. I'd love to get back out there um, and everywhere else in the very near future. So Thursday, let's just think, what are the things I need to tell you before we get cranking on our uh, commentary? So the pumpkin class is tonight, the sugar skull pumpkin class is tonight. If you wanted to do it and you didn't sign up in time, I can always send you a kit and you can watch the replay. The replay is for people in the class. It's not. I don't put it on, you know, universal uh, public um, just because we're you know chatting in class and it's you know sort of semi-private conversation but that's there if if you kind of drop the ball on that and you're sorry uh, to miss it it's still possible to always do that with my classes because they're always recorded um, sugar skulls I wanted to put the word out one more time does anybody have any uh, does anybody do locker hooking and do you have any locker hooking pieces that um, you could share with me if so um, that's that's one of the big holes for me because I want to include uh, locker hooking in the project I'm working on and I have a locker hooking piece I'm doing demonstrating but um, it's hard to find people who have done locker hooking and it's got me on the fence wondering if I really should have it in there at all but um, so many different types of rugs you know and that's just one of the many that has kind of fallen by the wayside it does have some merits for sure so just curious about that and I noticed Donna I'm not sure if you're on today um, Donna is a policewoman, so she's probably at work in Knoxville, Tennessee, I think. But I noticed that she wrote this morning on the Facebook group, and our Facebook group is Rug Hooking and Punch Needle Club. Beverly, I think you showed me yours, so I'm using that. 
I need I need even more to make it work because um, they are super scarce, right? Locker hooking is super scarce. And I loved your wagon wheel rug. I feel like I'm, I'm not going to do wagon wheel for this project because I'm staying away from anything that's that has any kind of a weaving element to it. But I love wagon wheel rugs and I feel like we should do a zoom or a video on uh, wagon wheel rugs later. It'd be super fun using hula hoops or something like that. It'd be super fun. Carol, good to see you. Good morning. Um, I noticed that Donna posted in our rug hooking and punch needle club a question about hooking higgledy piggledy. And I was so happy to see it. And, you know, it's, time is kind of a thing right now, but I did go through the comments because some of them were very thoughtful and thorough. And uh, it was an interesting, it was an interesting read because higgledy piggledy, if, if you are a rug hooker and you've been doing it a while, you've probably heard this expression and it is a, um, you know, it's a, it's a valid expression. It's not just something that we say when something doesn't look right. It's a style. In my mind, it's a style. And it's my, it's my favorite style. I love it. I love directional hooking. And that's one of the things we're going to look at in the Anne-Marie Littenberg book again today. I love directional hooking, but there are times and, and seasons, and it's usually that I really love higgledy piggledy because I love the unexpected um, sort of positioning of loops. I love it to look random. I love it to look a little bit wild and messy. That's my personal preference, right? We all have different preferences. And of course, that changes from piece to piece and moment to moment. But I love higgledy piggledy. And, and the thing about hooking higgledy piggledy is it's something that beginners do naturally and often, often, and then question whether their work should look like that because they're comparing themselves to other people, right? Which is which is never a good thing to do. You can aspire to, you can gather inspiration, you can you can add to your bag of tricks and your techniques, all of that stuff. Um, but don't compare yourself to another person uh, in that kind of a black and white way because once you start getting away from higgledy piggledy, once you start uh, being very formal about the way you hook, it is very hard to go back and do higgledy piggledy. Once it has been taught or trained out of you, it is very hard to go back and do it again. So I hate to see I hate to see that go. And as every as with everything in life, right? If you ha ever have a teacher who's telling you there's one way to do something, that is your cue to get another teacher, because higgledy piggledy is absolutely valid. And I, I was so happy to see that Donna was asking about how exactly to do it and that people were answering in a serious way and not just saying, oh, you don't want to do that anyway. You want to, you know, want to hook straight, you know, clean looking loops. People were perfectly understood the question and perfectly understood and sort of validated the idea that she wanted to hook in this more wild, unpredictable style. To me, it's more folky. It's more primitive. It's more original and authentic. But that's my two cents. I love it. Yeah, Chrissy, I probably will have a locker hooking class later. Locker hooking is when you're using a tool like in, in rug hooking backing, and it looks like a crochet hook, um, but it has a sewing needle on the other end. So it has a hook on one side, long metal rod, crochet hook one on one head, and then the other end is the large sewing needle to pull pieces through. And what's so great about it is that you can use ripped up like leftover quilt fabric, real, real scraps, real rag rug style. And you're using the, um, you're using the, the um, I just said it, latch hook backing, right? So you're not using a frame if you're coming new to the craft and you have not invested in a frame yet. This is one of the ways that you can make a rug without using a frame. It is rather pixelated, right? Because anytime you're working with a grid that's size that even the smallest gauge latch hook backing comes in, it's still quite pixelated. But depending on the size of your rug, right, the larger it is, the more detail you can get into a piece on that kind of a backing. But with locker hooking, you're literally pulling loops up and then locking them into place by running uh, a piece of fabric underneath them and pulling it through. So they are locked literally above the surface of the um, latch hook, right, canvas. So it's a little bit different. There's like a little bit of an extra step, but um, it's interesting, and we, sh we should do a class in everything coming up. I love that there is interest and enthusiasm. April, you're not late. You're perfect. You're perfect, and I'm happy you're there. So let's look real fast at this. Not real fast. Let's take our time and look at this because I've been enjoying this book just immensely. Remember, tomorrow night is cocktail night, so I won't be on with you in the morning. I'll be on at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we're going to look at hooking on the hill, right? That 
beautiful what is it um, Nancy Thomas Butts book is that right give me give me the thumbs up or something if that's right memory's not so good today I hope it's not that moment my mother forecast where I look like deer in the headlights of the camera and I have no idea what to say because my memory's finally shot um, not just yet so yesterday we were looking at this amazing book highly recommend hook drug landscapes Anne Marie Littenberg so again this was a what did we say 2009 something like that um, 2009 so still good um, so this isn't the book that if you belong to the rug hooking publisher right rug hooking magazine publisher their, their book house too if you belong to their book club they're probably sending you the new book on landscapes this isn't it so I thought perfect time for us to look at this book and man has this ever changed the way that I think about a landscape uh, in terms of what it is, in terms of what it can be, it I had such a such a sort of negative connotation in place about what a landscape looked like, just distant hills and grass and uh, some plants. And looking at this book has really changed that for me. And I think we left off looking at uh, Ray Harrell's piece. I think this is the last thing we looked at yesterday with the irregular border. And it, we were remarking for a good part of the day yesterday, on all the, you know, the very sort of Klimt Van Gogh influences in this particular rug, um, the irregular border certainly help with helping give it interest. It doesn't need any help because it's stunning. I love the two trees. It reminds me of Louise Penny, like two pines, right? That little village in the books. Um, absolutely beautiful. I think that's where we left off. And then that brought me to, I'm going to show you another image because the author, Anne-Marie Littenberg, has a lot of pieces in this book, and they are all stellar, including the one we looked at on the front cover. Remember how we were looking at the water and truly admiring? Well, I looked at this, and there's going to be some foreshadowing here, right? Another beauty, Van Gogh colors for sure. She's very, very good at doing not just reflections of... Um, images you know trees light sun and water but also like moonlight moonlight hidden grass remember the was the one I showed you yesterday um, let's what's it called let's take a walk in the moonlight I think with the two very small figures in this vast landscape and she posed the question is this rug about the moon the romantic moon the night sky the um, you know the outdoors the danger of being outdoors or this very small story of these two tiny characters in it that were like small as ants one uh, female figure and a dog on the beach and she posed all those questions what is the rug about and and then the ultimate question does it matter what you see is what you see what you get out of it is what you get out of it it's fantastic when things work that way so let's put that on hold, the one we just looked at by her, The Drowning Sea. Let's put that one in the back of our minds just for a little while. Now, she then shows us this group of uh, three, a triptych. So three panels, um, number three to number eight cuts. So many different cuts, mohair silk, possum yarns, dyed fleece on linen, designed and hooked by Carolyn Butolf, St. Johnsbury, Vermont. Um, According to Carolyn, making a triptych, each element, and let me show it to you now before I carry on with the quote. Try to first I'll give you the overall, and then let's look piece by piece. I love the way that triptychs um, have been working their way for the last century into mainstream art and not just religious art, right? Because in initially we were just seeing them as altar pieces. Uh, things that would open three-dimensionally um, and show scenes. But we are now seeing how effective a triptych can work with any kind of medium, any kind of subject. So we, we're going to look at those again, but she says, Carolyn says, um, inspired by her family farm in Shoreham, Vermont, making a triptych, by making a triptych, each element, in other words, the house, barns, truck, man, trees, dog, um, is allowed to have a larger presence within the panel. So let that one sink in because that is so smart, right? This is a great composition trick, a larger presence within the panel than it would if it were just part of a single rug. So good. Also, interest is added by the tension set up between the panels and how they relate to each other. Now, that is so true because when you're looking at a composition that's broken down into threes this way, I, I, number one, love her point that each thing, for example, the, the White House here, right, 
the barn is cut off here. The, this is kind of distracting the seam of the book. The red barn here. Yes, each of those elements are getting a lot more attention than they would if you were looking at them as one piece. Because while it's broken, broken up, it has that kind of puzzle, jigsaw puzzle element to it, doesn't it? And your eye, whether you mean for it or not, is seeking um, unity. And in doing that, your eye is trying to close the gaps, right? This little road up here is trying to uh, include the story of the man and the dog within the bigger story. It's, it's got the extra exercise, mental exercise of closing these gaps. And that creates a lot of tension and interest. Your eye is probably also saying, are, are the parts that are not there, are they continued? Like the answer in this case is yes. You see how the edge of the tree is here and the edge of this limb is here, right, connected. But it could easily not be, right? You could easily just crop out parts of it. And then your eye would really be working over time to make those connections and make the composition work. A lot of interest, but I love the idea. I love the point and I, the fact that she's aware that she's doing it of giving smaller parts of the story more weight because the composition is broken up. Because if you think about what we said yesterday in Anne Marie's fantastic advice about when you're approaching a um, landscape composition. There's going to be a lot, right? And she makes the very solid point. There's going to be a lot of ugly. Telephone wires, trash buckets, you know, all, all of these things that are part of the modern world that are not necessarily universal 100 years from now, right? Already in Europe, they have they don't have telephone poles. Everything's underground, which in Amsterdam meant they dug up the street every time someone's phone didn't work, but we won't start that. Um, these things are not eternal things. And when you're really looking to put things in the composition, you have the choice whether you want to include absolutely everything, laundry list of all you see, or whether you want to make really thoughtful choices about what elements you do want in the composition and put an emphasis on those rather than everything equal. So that really flies in the face of this, right? This is, an this is another idea completely that these two things can't really be combined. When you're making a triptych or like a many part thing, even if it's like a series of nine squares, you really need to be thinking about how it falls and what falls within each piece, right? And that's an exercise in and of itself, but it does give you the option of um, having three freestanding, right? It, unto themselves complete compositions and having them work together. I mean, it's such a cool thing to try, isn't it? Um, and, you know, you see a lot of things that work like this, people doing, for example, the Four Seasons or the Twelve Months, um, Phases of Life, right? Frank Sinatra song, Q, Q, Frank Sinatra song in the background at 17, right? But, you know, lots to think about. This book is filled with ideas. I was expecting pictures of landscapes, but it's filled with ideas. Now, this is the one I didn't get through yesterday, Charlton Idol. I absolutely loved it, this one. Hooked and designed by Jewel Marie Smith, Boston Spa New, Spa, New York. I love that area around Boston Spa. That's a good hooking area, too, and antiquing. What a glorious piece. So let's look at this first. Now, you often see lamb's tongue around the corners, right? You often see that. Nancy Butts Thompson, thank you, Jennifer. Um, I love the, I love this view. It's almost like it's panned out. You know when you pan out with your camera and you choose not the close-up button, not the regular button, but the one that pans way out? You get a bit of an unnatural scope, right? The camera's doing its panoramic thing and it's it's crowding the, the distance a little bit and it makes a slightly unnatural but very interesting perspective. That's what this reminds me of here, is looking through the camera when I'm on that mode. And there is something very fantasy um, about it, right? This building here has almost a castle-like quality. It's probably a town building. Beautiful farmhouse. Absolutely gorgeous, primitive the way it's set. You're getting a bit of a bird's view, a sky view, which is always interesting. Distant sheep, right, out on the hill here. A little bit of a, a church here, right? I mean, it's just a sweet village center, that Y-shaped road running right through. This is reversed for me. It's always hard to point. Uh, distant hills, right, really kind of flanking the the dips, the, the uh, little gullies in the composition here where the hills end. So cool. Great placement of clouds. But instead of giving us that straight lamb's tongue, she's giving us clamshell, right? She's giving us a partial pattern right around the border. Very sort of upholstery pattern, very rich textile kind of tapestry pattern, um, which is so 
interesting. She's also giving us a bit of a blue shadow, right? It has, it's not, it's not you and it's not the monitor. It has a little bit of a blue gray cast to it, which I think gives it softness and a bit of a fairy tale quality, right? The further up you go into the blue sky, looking down on something that's tinged with blue, it gives you a bit of a magical filter, doesn't it? So keep that one in mind. And then I'm going to show you this one because Anne Marie compares these two compositions. You're going to say those have nothing in common, but wait till you see, they have a lot in common. The second one is called Many Moons by Molly Dye, who I am so just crazy obsessed with right now. Jacksonville, Vermont, 2005. So, and this was made in memory of Patty Yoder. Uh, Many Moons, right? So, let me stand up, make sure we're in focus here. Now, you know, if you watch yesterday's episode, uh, Molly Dye is just, she's just extraordinary. Many moons, super colorful, very pattern driven, looks almost Russian, right? The divide, the breakup, almost like minaret type architecture here. Um, absolutely beautiful, right? So these two are in, on two facing pages, right? The um, idol and then many moons. So what the author says is once you have designed your individual elements how do you put them together to compose the entire scene now, that is the question isn't it do the, do the do the style color scale positioning and shapes of your elements make sense within your rug compare uh, jewel marie smith's charlton idol which was this one with molly dye's many moons which is this one depict uh, both depict a town or a village from a distance so that's what they have in common both have architecturally distinct buildings under the umbrella of a broad sky Im important we're going to look again yet the two rugs are vastly different the style the shape the colors of molly's buildings inspires make sense within the context of molly's rugs right that all makes perfect sense in terms of what we're looking at but how would the piece look if the yellow house from Char Charlton Idol was transplanted into many moons? It wouldn't look right at all, would it? I mean, you could say, well, it'd be an experiment in, um, in a, a collage type experiment in, in transposing styles. But the chances are it wouldn't, it wouldn't work great. Right right? It, it, everything is subjective and, and, you know, it would be up to you whether you would think that kind of juxtaposition was successful. But at the end of the day, composition works the same, whether, whether we're talking about art composition, music composition, people can say, um, I like that music. That music is very, very good. Technically, it's probably good. Like the music makes sense. It makes the notes make sense um, within the context of the song you rarely get a song that is not technically good music that is still a successful song. Whether you like the style or the singer or the words or whatever, it's just the way that it works. And it works the same way with composition. You can fool around uh, with different elements and you can break the boundaries in many ways with technique and approach and style, sizing, all balance, all of the things that we talk about. But when you have things that clash terribly within a composition, you really run the risk of it being illogical and thus unsuccessful. But that would always be up to you in the way that it was handled. I think part of the problem with this example too is that the yellow house is a very daytime sky and this is a very nighttime sky, isn't it? And they're hooked in two very different styles. It would be an uncomfortable marriage. They would be uncomfortable bedfellows for sure. She says the combination would be bizarre, lacking harmony and unity within the context of each individual rug. But, for example, if you were to put a yellow house into Molly Dye's composition, that would work. But you would expect it to be a yellow house in the style of Molly Dye, right? So there's the difference. Trick, tricky but true. Um, how would a pet... Okay. So she's also uh, furthering the point by saying how would, for example the patterning of the, the sort of upholstery clamshell that we were looking at work around this composition. And it wouldn't work at all, would it? Because it would be too busy. It would be much too busy. It works great here. It reinforces the idea that we're looking at kind of an illustration or a storybook kind of a picture. Um, but th working a border that busy around this piece, even if it was in the style of in the right colors, 
you would really be looking you would be it would almost be like buckshot right you would be looking at something that had such un, unfocused um, lines too busy just too busy there's so much busyness happening already and this composition can hold it but you add more to this composition that doesn't immediately enhance um, the strength that's already there and you're looking at buckshot at that point you're looking at um, no emphasis right it, a lot of confusion again everything is subjective and if you can see that piece with a busy border on it and you would want to hook something in that style then you should because everybody's taste is different absolutely and we always seek to push the envelope with everything right so this one is interesting too another molly dye i just i just love her so much uh stresa lake majori region Novelty Fabrics Yarns, Ribbon on Linen, Designed and Hooked by Molly Dye, 2006. Molly's View of the Mountainous Landscape in Italy. And again, unexpected colors. She's not bringing us into those kind of Italian autumnal colors. She's giving us the Klimt colors again, even more so, right? Primaries, reds, fuchsias, grays, these giant sort of bursts of light, Van Gogh type uh, lights in the sky. So interesting so shapey right point it looks like the almost like the grand tetons um so shapey and sharp very sharp composition on the ground and huge contrast with these very fat round clouds i'm assuming clouds absolutely beautiful and wild isn't it so again interesting so um yeah let's look at a few more I'm distracting myself. I just love this book so much. I find it so easy to get distracted. Let me skip over some of these. She talks in these chapters. She gives such helpful and specific information, um, and not not uh, not black and white type information. Like this is something to think about, and then you apply it to the piece that you're looking at or dreaming about or working on, right? So emphasis, she talked about balance, she's talking about emphasis, she's talking about proportion. This is something we talk about a lot, right? Um, even though if you are a rug maker, you work within the category of folk art, and you know that proportion is a, is a moving target, right? Because the, the less regard you give to proportion and perspective, the more toward folk art you move. And that is fine within our medium. That is very desirable. It just depends on what you're trying to do, doesn't it? It just depends on what you're trying to do. So for example, oh, this is another cute one. This doesn't relate to what I'm talking about, but let's look at another Molly Dye, Hadley 3. Um, that's what this one is called. I mean, looking at these books, I, I want a book just on Molly Dye. I really do. Not that I don't love every other uh, illustration in this book, but I would love to just look at her pieces. They are so good and solid. She's doing something here, again, with composition that is very unexpected. She's giving us just a suggestion of a shape for that little barn-type building, right? These big, fat, rolling hills. She's giving us a lot of round. And she's giving us her, her cloud style that has a jewel-like quality because she's picked out different shapes in the center of these clouds. Very colorful. They're not cloud colors. She's got four distinctly different hill colors. Looks like they've been made from tweeds or some kind of over-dyed fabric that's been cut up. Could possibly all be the same fabric over-dyed in four different colors. Do you see what I mean? The more I look at it, the more I think that's probably what she was up to, is over-dyeing like a very, very uh, gray and white houndstooth, that kind of thing, and then hooking with it. But to break up all this roundness, she gives us some very straight, angular, kind of arrow-like trees. Very skeletal, very spare, um, really, really breaks up the round stuff that she's doing. She's giving us a good balance, right? Talking about balance, she's giving us a good balance. In this piece, as abstract and colorful as it is, has it has very realistic perspective, doesn't it? The, the placement of that house on that hill in terms of what's around it, that's fine. That's not, it's not too small or too big. That works real well. So it just goes to show you that within a composition that is very far away from traditional, you can still, when you're blowing out the colors, you're blowing out the shapes, and you're keeping one thing like perspective, or sorry, proportion, that's an interesting thing to do too, isn't it? Because it's like you've chosen 
decision-making process at the beginning of the composition, right? You've chosen to keep some things and let other things go. So interesting things to think about too, not just in terms of things you're putting into the composition, but the, the sort of properties of a composition that you want or don't want. Do I want balance? Do I want a uh, proportion to be correct? Do I want the perspective to be correct? Do I want to see a horizon line and be working off that like a classical piece? Um, what things don't I want to be there? If I want, if I'm Magdalena, Brian, or Eby, and I want no perspective, I've got my, or proportion, I've got my, my ducks bigger than my horses, and they're upside down around, around the top of the tree, right? The lollipop tree. So you can also make choices about those things. It's like almost like two lists you've got going, things to include and things that I want to regard or versus disregard in this composition. This is only if you're not working realistically, of course. And then she shows something very, very different. A wool rug on, where's mine? Where's mine that Tara gave me? I think I already put it somewhere. I already hung it up, I think. Dangy. Oh, it would have been perfect for right now. Yeah, I think I already hung it up. Um, from Quebec, 1950s, right? These kinds of souvenir, beautiful um, rugs that you would get that are like mug rug size, right? Quite small. People framed them. The thing about them, they're landscapes, of course. Very, very precise handling, very precise hooking. And, you know, at this time, it's worth saying, I'm going to show you another one of those just to show you, you know, to look at where we are. It's, it's also important, obviously, to look at where we've come from. So this is more where we've come from. Still not a realistic piece at all. This person who's hooked this has made some very smart choices about what to include and what not to include. And I think that the sort of broken look of the tree with the snow on it is very smart, right? The very irregular fence that seems to uh, be missing some posts, very, very smart. The white house and the red barn look very sturdy and stable and strong. Everything else is a bit um, spiny and skeletal. I think that shows a lot of contrast. There's not a lot of um, color here, but you get great contrast between the red and the white. Everything else kind of fall back, falls back. So then this person at one point was saying to themselves, what's important to me in this piece? Contrast. That was one of the things that they thought was important. Uh, and that is how you get away with having that much white in one piece. What was I saying? Um, you know, when you look at rugs that are this finely made, yes, in part it's because they were being made like in a workshop situation and they were be do being done at great speed. And it was a bit of, this is 1950s, and remember, the year 1950 is the year Paint by Number came out. People were working in this style, filling in colors sort of mindset, right? But you also have to remember that at this point in history, getting away from the hooked rug, the needlepoint rug was very popular at this point. The needlepoint rug and the rug that was done with wool, but like a cross stitch, an oversized cross stitch, do you know what I mean? You see them on blankets, you see them as rugs, as wall pieces. 1950s was like the, the height of that kind of um, craft, right? Doing needlepoint rugs and doing cross-stitch rugs. That was really big at that time. And these hooked rugs really have that look. Like, is it a needlepoint or is it a hooked rug? We know it's a hooked rug because it's been told to us in this book. And she's certainly right. But interesting to think about the crossovers and what's going on on the periphery too. Now this one, I'm going to show you this Molly dye too because I can't resist. If you have been to, you know how much I love Cape Cod, if you've been to Provincetown, this is the Provincetown Monument, it's a pilgrim monument that stands very, very, very high above the town. So the scale is off because this says P-Town, so I assume this is the Pilgrim's Monument. Um, stands very, very tall among the, the landscape with nothing anywhere near it. It's very tall. But the suggestion of little white houses, right, um, possibly the sea. I'm, I'm thinking that could be the sea behind. I'm not sure how much is sea, how much is land. But if that is P-Town, you know, it could equally be, now I'm second guessing myself, it could be the church in the center of town. You know what? That makes a lot more sense. It's probably the church in the center of town because the monument would be standing so much higher. Of course, she could disregard perspective and proportion and go that way, but I think this is the church that's right behind the main street there. A little bit of confusion, even for me who knows this town, like the back of my hand, because of the handling of it. She's got, she's got a story that's important in place, which is the scattering of little white houses, right? Because that really calls out to you, Cape Cod. And then she's got the church building hidden behind trees, 
those little houses so sweet yeah oh they are so sweet crystal um and then she's got some very again this sort of minaret style she's picked out steeples and she's added colors in some places and kept it very so puritan like white house um in other places she's got a real contrast going on there and the colors are very unnatural so when you start with that um you have a really blank canvas right if you're new to designing compositions you're new to hooking you probably want to start by if you're doing something like what we're talking about today eliminating um, some of the composition, simplifying it, in other words, and then you're thinking about what you want to do in terms of what things do you want to keep in place and what things do you want to peel away. You should really keep at least one thing in place. Even that picture with the round hills and the little farm building on top, the perspective was right. Everything else was like off kilter, right? I think it's a good idea, not telling you what to do, not ever telling you what to do, but I think it's a good idea, particularly if you're approaching this style new, to keep at least one element of classic composition in place, right? Just as a um, foundation. And then you can mess with everything else. So she is really keeping, um, she's keeping perspective certainly in place in this one again. But she's got, if this is P-Town and that's the church, the distances are very different. These are not the houses that are immediately in front of the church. The colors are very different. And the two minaret buildings, I can't identify those at all. They could be, no, I was going to say they could be two other churches, but not where they are. So, you know, she's adding a lot of things and uh, inventing a lot of things. And that's part of the beauty and the joy of a piece like this. But when you're working your piece, if you're going to try to work in this style, again, try to keep one, at least one thing that's in place that um, relates to solid traditional composition and then full with the rest of it. Now, this piece does that too. This piece is called Laundry Day. This is another fantastic example. Polly, let me show you the piece first, and then I'll tell you what the author writes. I talk about uh, some fine hooking here, right? Seriously directional hooking. Very, very simple. Almost looks like a silk screen, doesn't it? Now we're gonna look at it again, now that you took a photo picture with your eyes. So the author says, Polly Alexander's Laundry Day clearly demonstrates some simple ways to achieve perspective. It provides an excellent lesson in the positioning and enhancement of items in the foreground, midground, and background. Let's just pause for a second. And this is like in the ABC book of what she's describing here. Foreground, light green, middle ground, dark green, background, sky. You've got three shelves or layers of color. Very easy to identify provides an excellent uh, lesson in positioning and enhancement of items in the foreground. Yeah, First, look at the laundry line that stretches from the distant white house on the left to the immediate right foreground. The clothes in the foreground have the most space between them. The clothes seem to get uh, closer together the further away they are on the line. Smart, right? Let's, we're going to look at it again. In addition, note the size of the clothes. The bikini and the blue plaid dress each measure much larger than the size of the distant house dress. So let's look at what she's describing here, because this is all very good. Get up. So it's kind of funny, and I think a, a little ironic funny, that the bikini is the first thing that we see because it's huge compared to the other things. If that bikini were way back at the end of the line, it wouldn't read as a bikini at all, would it? I think it's funny that it's the closest thing to the viewer. It gives you an idea of season, right? Everything is lush and green. That's a good cue. But seeing that bikini is another very good cue. Um, and the skirt, and then it is the point she's making, the further back you go, the smaller the items seem. Very easy way to give perspective. Another thing that's working over time for this composition is that fence in the distance because it's grounding that building. That building is not floating in face. As long as that fence is there, it gives us a horizon line for that building. Our eye is longing for something in this very curvy, sort of sexy composition. In the distance, we get that solid line that we need to anchor our eye, right? It's comfortable. It's comfortable to look out in this, almost the smack center of the composition, see that um, horizontal line. It really gives strength. So there's a lot, even with a simple composition like this, more, more like laundry life. Yeah, totally. It really gives strength um, 
these little tricks that she's doing. You know, the laundry line, this was done by Polly Alexander, Essex Junction, Vermont. I've seen so many laundry lines lately. They're all fascinating. I think Dion Fitzpatrick does a lot with laundry lines. Also, Laura Kenny, two Canadian artists, right? Rug hooking artists. Um, both do th this kind of composition. This one, this is Vermont, but this one is uh, 2003. A little bit different because it does remind me of like a, a very graphic poster but with this sort of little joke about the laundry line going to the house. Um, so much happening with the clothing in an area that looks so remote, too. There's a bunch of kind of um, um, contrasts here. The really colorful bikini, um, very busy bikini, very spare landscape, and then the amount of clothes, amount of colorful clothes in a not very colorful setting, in a very remote setting, too. There's a few little jokes that are going on that I think are really are really smart. This is gorgeous, too. Let me show you one by the author. This is called Waiting. Let me see what she says about this. She will, let me show you this first. She will talk about both of these. Sorry, the, the sun is a bit of a thing today. I'm tipping the book a bit. Now, when I first looked at this piece, Waiting, remember the Let's Take a Walk in the Moonlight? I think that's what it was called with the dog and the woman on the beach. Here's the character of the woman here. So she seems very drawn to... She seems very drawn to a vast landscape with a small figure, right? For, for proportion for Anne-Marie is, is important. Um, she's doing a lot of tricks with it. When I looked at the composition just like that, the composition uh, at first glance reminded me of The Scream, right? Edouard Mooch's The Scream. So I thought, interesting, there's that kind of pathway that's leading backwards, sort, similar sort of chaotic hazy colors, right? So all of that kind of contributed. But then the overall picture, there's a lot of other stuff going on. Let me bring you closer to the hills. The directional hooking in the sky, she's definitely showing us that the light is coming from this side of the sky. It's much more intense yellow, isn't it? Than, for example, here. Beautiful blue, right? She does a lot of unexpected color. The blue and the orange contrasting colors opposite sides of the color wheel. Very smart, very smart color scheme. And here's the yellow to pop it the shape of the tree is really echoing the hill behind it, isn't it? Now, she's giving us a story within a story here because I like this road that's like leading out to, gosh, that's hard to do in reverse, uh, like a vanishing point on the horizon line, the vanishing point. And then she gives us this secondary line, which is a little fence that is completely enclosing this little figure. Now, this is a big world picture, and we got a little figure right here. Now, there's something for me about looking at this picture where when I see this vast, vast, vast world and this tiny person in it, this fence makes me feel good. This fence makes me feel safe. It's an enclosure. You know, in my mind, this represents safety because she's little, and this is, this is a big world, right? All these little storytelling devices within a composition that really help um, push the story along for the, for the viewer. Anne Marie is so good. She works in such an impressionist style, doesn't she? She's really good. I'm going to show you a couple more. Let's play in the moonlight. This is a detail of that that we looked at yesterday. And the reason she's showing you the detail is because it is a huge, uh, much bigger scale piece. But she's showing you how when she's working her tricks, she is using a lot of outlining and contrast, really bright and light give you the look of the moon. You see the, the light is touching the trees and has them in silhouette, but you can see how she's also hooked a very light line around the dog and the figure. And that's really in the distance helping it pop, right? It's not something that you would notice first, but it's really helping it stand out because the ground is busy. It's smart. And she shows us this piece, too. I've just got to show this to you. This is uh, Jen Lavoy, Huntington, Vermont, 2007, Canyon de, de Shelley, or Kelly Shelley, uh, hand-painted wool on linen. And we're, I haven't come back to that theme that we started at the beginning either that we will come back to. But this is such an extraordinary piece here. Another vast piece, right? Background hand-painted, so put that thought on hold. A lot of busyness, right? Lot, almost surrealist composition here. A um, lot of busyness. These canyon walls, very rigid, very straight, very strong, and these very organic surrealist style trees winding, you know, winding their way across. Very colorful, very natural. Um, kind of the opposite of the of the vertical um, 
um, walls, right? The cavern walls. And then this very small figure sitting on a real traditional woven rug, looking away. Beautiful story, beautiful composition, very, very, very strong and different, right? So we have got a horizon line, we've got the vanishing point, and the character is at the vanishing point, right? Which puts her kind of at the end of the world, which is an interesting story anyway, because it forces us to look toward what she's looking at, which is like the great unknown, isn't it? I'm sure there's maybe more of a story happening here, but just things that you pick out at first glance. So this book is filled with uh, interest. This is interesting too. I'm gonna stop in a minute because it's getting super late. Um, again, Jen Lavoie, Huntington, Vermont, the woman in the red wool suit. Remember how that picture from the 1940s that came out of Quebec, somebody's parents bought it, you know, on a, on a trip, was so powerful, although it was very, very, very white, white on uh, cream, on vanilla, on more white. And the thing that really helped that composition was the, the side of the red barn being uh, completely uncovered with snow, uh, very clear shape and very red, right? Same thing is happening here. I love these kinds of pictures, right? I've seen some compositions like this. This is obviously in a gallery or museum space, but I've seen some like this where there's a bunch of quilts within the hooked rug and you get almost a Russian nesting doll of images, like images within images. It's one of my favorite things. But you can see how important the color red is in this composition because the woman is in red and she's really, she's looking at these two pictures. So these two are pretty stable. These could be unstable and forgotten, but they, they feature enough red within them, at least three of them, to pull back to the coat. So it creates a great um, sense of, of unity and harmony, being able, you know, your eye to read the red in those three paintings that might otherwise be just kind of lost or forgotten and bringing them back to the woman who is, who is the main character in the story. Yeah, amazing, right, Crystal? That one is just crazy, crazy times. So there's so many more I want to show you, but I'm not going to show them all because I've got to get going. I'm going to show you this one, Dance in the Triumph of Summer, again by Anne-Marie Littenberg. So coming back to this idea, remember we were looking at the cover yesterday and the reflection of the trees in the water? It's in the one I showed you earlier today. It says hand her technique, this is uh, Dance in the Triumph of Summer, um, 2007. She's saying that sh that uh, this is hand painted wool, so this certainly looks like this technique we've talked about many times, where you hook it and then paint it. So you're not hooking with colored wool; you're hooking with white wool loops that you are then painting after they are hooked. This certainly looks like the technique to me. I haven't found in the book that it says that's exactly what she's doing, but how can it be? How can it be otherwise, really? I mean, isn't that extraordinary? I love how she experiments with so many different techniques. This makes more sense to me now if the water is hand painted. And let me show you a couple more um, that really reinforce why I think that. I think this is one. No, that's a different one. This is Barbara um, Held. I'm not sure about this one, actually. This is almost like a Bargello composition that ends up looking like a, obviously, landscape and beautiful autumn landscape. Um, I would think that this was hand painted, can't be sure, but again, it has that kind of look, doesn't it? But there are a few more by the author that make me think absolutely that has to be what that has to be what she's doing. Let me see if I can find one more just to please myself. Oh, there's one. I wanted a better. Here's one. Oh no, this is. Oh yeah, designed and hooked by Anne Marie Littenberg, Rosy Fingered Dawn. Two actually, two for one special. Burning Kisses in the Sun, so both by the author. Right, first look at this one. And then this one. And if you're coming to us new on the show, remember Donna Swanson at Whispering Hill, the rug cooking store in the quiet corner of Connecticut, gave us the tip that when you do painting or touching up to use a toothbrush, I'm much more inclined myself to use those um, those pens from Amazon, the packs of felt tip pens that a very fine variety of tips with an empty reservoir, almost like an old fashioned ink pen that you would fill with ink, except you're filling it with water, right? And it could be colored water, it could be dye, dyed, dyed water, obviously you want paint with color. But that would be another, I think, good option if you wanted to attempt this technique. There are so many more, but you know what, maybe get the book because it's just, it's over the top. 
it's over the top. Here's another one by the author. Let me show you one more of these crazy painted ones. Whole different look, right? I mean, that must be terribly monotonous to hook. But then you have the joy of knowing that what you have to look forward to is the painting part. Or any fine, you know, Crystal, you're right. Any fine paintbrush would work. Um, then you're just doing dipping. I'm just thinking with the ones with the reservoir, you squeeze a little and it comes out like a little bit wet if you need it. But absolutely, paint, you know, dropping your, the thing I worry about is carrying, right? You have to be so careful carrying your, or holding your um, cup of paints over what you're about to do. I just worry about carrying the ink that's wet, the dye that's wet across the composition for myself because I know how I am and it is clumsy clumsy uh, times always but yeah that's how I, I like the idea of the pen because you're not carrying it until you kind of squeeze it the color doesn't come out but absolutely of course you could use any paint brushes because you're not as clumsy as I am I have no doubt about that no doubt at all you are a heck of a lot neater Salisbury Plain I love this one Molly dye another beautiful Salisbury England again very unusual colors look at all that busyness Look at the roundness in the sky. Look, she gives a lot of shape to the ground. Absolutely beautiful. <laughs> you know, you can use anything, right? People, we keep talking about things to use, and I keep forgetting that rug hookers originally hooked with a bent nail. And every time I remind myself of that, everything else seems silly, doesn't it? So this book is just, this is one of these to die for books. You must get it. Now, I said yesterday, it came with a pattern comes with this pattern. Let's see what it is. Haven't taken it out yet. Let me be careful. I'm guessing it's something from these pages. Yikes. All right. Let's see. Rug Cooking Magazine. Oh, is this? Oh, okay. Wait a minute. Is this? Which one is this? Okay. The Road, uh, the road Norton, Kansas, Looking West. So this is the pattern that's in here. You know, this gives you a great example of... Um, composition, what the author does for composition. Remember her, her vast landscapes? Can't you see a tiny person in it somewhere? I mean, I, there isn't one, but I mean, it just seems very Anne Marie to put a tiny person off in the distance. We're looking at a horizon line. We're looking at a vanishing line right here, right? We're looking at depth, foreground, middle ground, background, way back here. This is really dominant, which is nice. It's gonna cut up the composition in a very interesting way. Oh, it's getting hot in here. The heat must be blasting. Let me see if I can find that one in the book to show you, and we'll end on that. Shoot, I was hoping it would be immediately there. Let's see. I was hoping it would show us just where uh, in the book it was. I was going to do this great reveal, but it doesn't really work if I can't show you the finished one, does it? Oh, here it is, right here. The Road, the road Norton, Kansas, Looking West. Designed by Anne Marie Littenberg, 2008. So this is it hooked. And you know, I think she's done her business in the sky there too. Isn't that great? That has a real Van Gogh feel to it. Look at that tree. The orange and the blue and the yellow, right? That's pro probably what's making me think of Van Gogh. Gorgeous piece, isn't it? I absolutely love this book. I absolutely let me put this back before I lose it. Um, Hooked Rug Landscapes by Anne-Marie Littenberg, 2006. Rug Hooking Magazine Press, right? The publishing part of it, the book publishing part. Absolutely fantastic. Remember, there's a link to the book on Amazon here, but if you end up going to Rug Hooking Magazine to buy the book, make sure that you use our special code RCH15 to get 15% off, because why not, right? So I hope you enjoyed that episode. That was super long. I'm so sorry. I've been, taking, I've been doing extra long episodes. Um, because I've been doing slightly less episodes, right? But I will see you tomorrow at cocktail time, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and we will be looking at Nancy Thomas Butts' um, Hooking on the Hill. Beautiful, charming, and cozy book for us on a Friday night. Have a great afternoon, everybody. I will see you tomorrow. Take care.